My name is Sanjay Gupta. I'm a consultant cardiologist in York. Today, I wanted to talk to you about inflammation and in particular inflammation and how it relates to the heart and how we can possibly measure inflammation. Okay, so let's get started. The first thing to say is that virtually all chronic disease, when you look at the roots, when you go right down and say, well, why does chronic disease happen? The answer is chronic inflammation, okay? Uh, what do I mean by inflammation? Stress. Stress on the organs, stress on our blood vessels over a period of time. And what happens is when our bodies are stressed like this, the bodies react, our vital organs react, our blood vessels react, and that reaction over a period of time can trigger changes within the actual structure of the, uh, the, the tissue, the blood vessels, etc. And those changes uh, then uh, result in us not getting as much blood as we want, our tissues not functioning as well as they should. So in the heart, the big problem is something called atherosclerosis, which means wear and tear and hardening of the blood vessels. So what is happening here is that the blood vessels are subjected to low-grade stress over a long period of time. And because of that, changes occur in the blood vessels. They become less stretchy. They become harder. Uh, and they are more prone uh, to developing um, a thickening of the blood vessels and as the blood vessels get thicker they get irregular um, uh, calcium cholesterol these things get stuck in the blood vessels and the lumen of the blood vessels progressively starts getting narrower and narrower and as the vessel gets narrower this this disease this crud which is encroaching into the lumen is called atherosclerotic plaque and this is um, the major problem we face in cardiology, which is how do we stop this plaque from developing? Because if the plaque is allowed to develop, then slowly and gradually, the blood vessels do not get enough blood through to our vital organs, and particularly our heart. And that is how people develop angina. And when the blood vessel blocks off, that's how people develop heart attacks, strokes, etc. So for... Um, for us, what, as cardiologists, what we realize is that the, the thing that causes the plaque to develop is inflammation. And learning to recognize its presence, being able to measure its severity, and then using treatments which specifically target the inflammation may help uh, make a significant contribution to how we manage our patients in the future. And for scientists, it's very important to look out for any compound or biochemical that can be easily obtained from the patient, which may give us an indication as to whether there's this low-grade inflammation going on. Because remember, a lot of bad things that happen, like heart attacks, strokes, they happen, they're a late sign, right? They're a late sign. For a long period of time, the person may have all these changes going on in their body, but they may not know anything about it. And then suddenly, lo and behold, you know, five years or 10 years down the line, they have a heart attack or a stroke. And they say, well, why did this happen? And so if you could in some way use a marker of inflammation and be able to measure a marker and monitor it and treat it, then maybe you could improve outcomes for the patient. So in that sense, the most extensively studied marker of inflammation is something called C-reactive protein, CRP. And in this video, I'm going to talk about CRP in a little bit more detail. Now, CRP is an acute phase protein, which is produced mainly in the liver. And its production is influenced by things called cytokines. Uh, cytokines um, include interleukin-6, tumor necrosis factor alpha. CRP tells us that there is inflammation within the body. What it doesn't tell us is where the inflammation is and what the cause of the inflammation is. But if the CRP is elevated, then that's telling us that there is inflammation. CRP will go up both in acute inflammation. So let's say I get a pneumonia, for example, my body's acutely inflamed, my CRP will shoot up. But CRP will also go up in chronic inflammation. The CRP doesn't go up as high in chronic inflammation um, and it goes up much higher in acute inflammation. Now, 
CRP can be used to monitor inflammation and if the CRP is going up then it means that there is more inflammation and if the CRP comes down then it means that there's less inflammation. So that's good. So in that sense it's telling us about inflammation and you can use it to monitor the levels of inflammation which is interesting. In epidemiological studies there are we have observed a few interesting things. One that there appears to be a significant association between elevated CRP levels and underlying atherosclerosis. So if people have a slightly higher CRP level, they tend to have a greater likelihood of developing atherosclerosis or having atherosclerosis. Where the CRP level is elevated, there tends to be an association with increased number of uh, cardiac events in people who are already known to have vascular or heart disease. So if you have vascular disease, heart disease, and your CRP is up, you're more likely to have events. Elevated CRP levels can also herald the or can also indicate a higher incidence of a first cardiac event in patients who are at a higher risk of uh, inflammation. And CRP also gives us additional information over and above traditional risk factors regarding the risk of future events. So if you have, for example, a person who smokes, who's diabetic and who has high blood pressure, um, but has normal or low CRP levels, their risks are going to be lower than a person who does all those things and has higher CRP levels. So CRP adds something. An elevated CRP level tells you something more than just you know, traditional risk factors. What we don't know is whether the CRP is a bystander that is responding to inflammation. So the inflammation is happening and that is causing the CRP to go up or whether it is in some way contributing to the, the inflammation. Is CRP something that is actually specifically causing the inflammation or is it just a marker of inflammation? Is it a witness or is it the culprit? All right. So we don't know. Now, there are some studies and uh, trying to work out whether it's a culprit or a witness. If you take um, CRP, you inject it into tissue, that can stimulate inflammation in lab studies. But the general thinking at this point in time, based on bigger studies, is that perhaps CRP is just a witness. It's a bystander. It's not the culprit itself. Now, the next question is, how do we measure CRP? You know, there's this wonderful um, uh, uh, compound which you can uh, use to tr track inflammation. So how do you measure it? Well, it's a simple blood test, okay? And there are two ways it can be measured. Uh, the traditional assay is the one that they use in every hospital now. And in that, you are looking for acute inflammation. So with that, the limit of detection with those assays is three to five milligrams per liter. This is much higher uh, than what you would expect in normal, apparently healthy individuals. And so it is not ideal to look for that low-grade inflammation that we want to look for for underlying chronic disease. If you have a chest infection, you go to a hospital, your CRP levels will be elevated. If the infection gets worse, the CRP gets worse. If the C infection gets better, the CRP gets better. But those levels are very high. They're measuring acute uh, inflammation. A better CRP assay is something called high sensitivity CRP. Now these are detecting very tiny concentrations of CRP which may indicate chronic inflammation in some people uh, and in these people the um, the levels of CRP are between you know are often around about 0.3 milligrams per liter so really low you know normal CRP in a hospital is the assay is only going as low as three to five, but with these high sensitivity assays, you can pick up very, very small amounts of CRP, which may indicate inflammation in otherwise healthy people who don't have any acute inflammation. What we really don't know as yet is what are the ideal values, but you can divide high sensitivity CRP levels into three groups. Uh, anything above three milligrams per liter, which is considered high, anything between one to three milligrams per liter, which is considered average, anything below uh, one milligram per liter, which is considered low. Anyone who has levels of greater than 10 obviously has something acute going on and that's what you want to look for. But, uh, you know, anything below three, so, so between one and three, so people who are three are considered high, 
and people who are less than one are considered low. And the other thing, of course, to say is it's, it's less reliable relying on one single measurement. What you want to do is get an average of at least two measurements taken two days apart, uh, two, two weeks apart for, for this kind of risk stratification. Okay. Um, it's worth also knowing that CRP is affected by lots of other things in women, particularly uh, between the ages of 18 and 44. Hormonal changes can affect our small levels of CRP. So uh, CRP levels tend to be highest during menstruation, lowest during inf uh, ovulation. Um, it's also worth knowing that hormone therapy in women can affect CRP. Women in general tend to have higher CRP levels than in men, um, than men. Uh, ethnicity can also have an impact on CRP levels. So African Americans have higher baseline CRP levels and East Asians have lowest CRP levels. But nevertheless, although the baseline may be different in these groups, if you look at these groups, those people who have a higher CRP tend to have a higher risk of out bad outcomes compared to people who have lower. What we don't know is what is normal in these groups. Uh, but in general, if you compare uh, high levels versus low levels in these particular groups, the people with high levels tend to do badly. Um, now, what do we know about CRP and cardiac risk in particular? Uh, in this, the first thing is in the general population, what we have sh found is that a baseline CRP predicts high sensitivity CRP, predicts the long-term risk of a first heart attack, stroke, the development of high blood pressure, even sudden death. And, and this relationship is maintained despite adjusting for things like smoking, diabetes, uh, high blood pressure, cholesterol, etc. So high sensitivity CRP, if it's high in healthy populations, in general, apparently healthy people, those people who have a higher CRP uh, tend to do worse than people in general who have a much lower CRP. That doesn't mean to say just because your CRP is elevated, you will do badly. That does not what I'm saying. It is just that you belong to a population of people who will probably do worse than a population who have a very low CRP. In fact, there was a study called the Framingham Offspring Study, and they looked at 3,006 patients without any cardiovascular disease. They followed these guys up for 12 years, and they found that the patients who had a CRP of greater than 3 milligrams per liter had significantly higher cardiac events compared to patients with a CRP of less than um, um, one milligram per liter. Um, again, another group of patients that we know a little bit about CRP in is patients who have stable coronary disease. So these are people who have angina, but it's stable angina, people who've had a bypass, people who've had a stent, but they're not getting ongoing chest pain, you know, it's stable disease. In these patients, what uh, there was a study called PEACE, uh, where they studied 3,771 patients, and they found that, again, patients who had CRP levels of greater than 3 milligrams per liter had a higher risk of events such as heart attacks, strokes, etc., over five years. Uh, and they found that elevated CRP levels not only predicted an event, but were also predictive of development of diabetes and also predictive of um, development of heart failure. And those people who appear to have the highest CRP levels seem to have more rapid progression of their coronary disease. So if you've had uh, a bypass, and if you take a population of people who've had a bypass, measure their CRP levels, those people who have slightly higher CRP levels will probably have more rapid progression of their uh, coronary disease. Uh, the next group is those people who have unstable coronary disease, patients who've come in with unstable angina, who've just had a heart attack. Well, in those people, CRP levels are much higher anyway because these people are acutely inflamed at that point. Um, and, but what we do know is that not everyone who comes into a have, uh, with a heart attack will have elevated CRP levels, uh, but the majority do. People who have elevated CRP levels on discharge um, from hospital after their event tend to have a worse prognosis compared to people who have very low CRP levels. So it does appear that CRP can help us detect populations at higher risk, but there are lots of questions that remain unanswered. Firstly, what we don't know is what is um, 
uh, the normal CRP level because we have to work out what is normal in different groups, you know, different ethnic groups, different genders, etc. Um, that we don't know what what is the kind of normal value, so we don't have that. Uh, if you are screening CRP, how often should you be screening? We don't know that. Do treatments that lower CRP make a difference to outcome? Because just because something is um, elevated and may indicate um, that the patient will do badly, doesn't automatically mean that if you target it, the patient will do well. So you need studies, etc., to try and tell us whether you know, treating the CRP or doing things that reduce the CRP actually improve outcomes. Um, in that sense, there was a really interesting study called Jupiter. And in Jupiter, what uh, the authors uh, hypothesized was they said, look, statins reduce cholesterol and statins reduce inflammation and they, they, they reduce CRP. So how about we take healthy people who have normal cholesterol values, but who have elevated CRP levels of greater than two, and how about we give them um, a statin, in this case, rosuvastatin, and see what happens. And what they found was they had to stop the study early after a mean of 1.9 years, because they found that the group that were taking rosuvastatin did better than the people who were taking placebo. There were more cardiovascular events in the group that were taking placebo. So these were healthy people, normal cholesterol levels, but higher CRP levels. And in those people, um, it appeared that rosuvastatin uh, protected them against uh, future events. However, the study was criticized for lots of reasons. One, the number of events was very low, and it was after calculating um, things, it became apparent that you would have to treat 500 odd patients on Crestor or Resuvastatin for one year to prevent one non-fatal or fatal heart attack. And so in that sense, it just doesn't make sense to treat so many people with this particular medication, which may have side effects, which may increase the risk of diabetes, etc., uh, for that very minimal benefit. And with Jupiter, there was another problem where there was some conflict of interest as the study was funded by AstraZeneca and a lot of the leading investigators had ties with the pharmaceutical company. And so that, that you know, there was obvious conflict of interest. So that's why the data from Jupiter have not translated into clinical practice and we still don't screen populations based on, with CRP measurements. Um, so from my perspective, I think it's useful to understand that inflammation is important, inflammation is bad. Um, and this is an exciting space. We need to understand inflammation a lot better. We need to find other markers, maybe a combination of different markers and trying to work out whether, you know, uh, you can get better prediction of events and perhaps treat, finding treatments that reduce lots of inflammatory markers and seeing whether that then translates into better outcomes. Uh, I think it's always important to stress one thing, that wherever possible we should avoid inflammation and control our risk of inflammation uh, by use of the anti-inflammatories that nature provides us with. Okay? Nature provides us with some amazing anti-inflammatory agents. These include good healthy food, keeping well hydrated, uh, good sleep, reducing stress, plenty of exercise, avoiding toxins, and wherever, trying to be as happy as possible, because happiness, joy is very anti-inflammatory and keeps us well.